March of 2001, eight months before the launch of the original Xbox, Sony, IBM and Toshiba announced that they had joined forces to create the Cell, an advanced microprocessor designed for next generation computers and digital consumer electronics. The Cell would go on to power the Sony PlayStation 3. It featured a 64-bit RISC multi-threaded multi-core architecture, optimized for compute-intensive workloads, and ran on PowerPC. IBM would also utilize the PowerPC architecture to use on the up-and-coming GameCube that would release later in 2001. Nintendo's requirements for this next-generation console was very clear. The chip must be powerful but cheap to manufacture and not run very hot. And in the end, they ended up working with IBM to handle the production of the CPU for the GameCube, which was based on the well-known PowerPC 750CX processor. In the early days of the project, our goals in choosing the PowerPC was clean and simple risk architecture, also focused on giving software developers the quickest development rate, said Howard Chen, technical director of Nintendo Technology Development at the time. Nintendo would stick with PowerPC for the upcoming Wii and Wii U systems before ultimately switching to an ARM-based SoC for the Nintendo Switch in 2017. Microsoft, on the other hand, bet the farm on Intel. After all, they'd been in close partnership for years with both MS-DOS and Windows operating systems and the original Xbox often being labeled as a PC that would play games. This wasn't an entirely true statement, however. The original Xbox contains custom hardware that is not available on any other system. It also contains a customized kernel, which is optimized for gaming. But it's true, the original Xbox does share much with an off-the-shelf PC. For example, the Celeron processor, the memory chips, the North and South bridge and IDE devices. It's also possible to perform RAM and CPU upgrades to an original Xbox, increase the hard disk space, replace drives with modern SSDs and even flash a Linux kernel. This also meant that porting games from the PC to the original Xbox was an easier task than let's say the GameCube or the PS2, which required the developer to understand a different architecture and a different graphics and file system and sound API. The biggest limitations of the original Xbox was its memory, with 64 megabytes of RAM meant that some care had to be taken. For example, if we take a game like Max Payne, comparing the PC and Xbox versions, they almost look identical, thanks to the DirectX 8 API being almost one-to-one -one across both systems. If we take a closer look at Max Payne, the biggest difference is the increase in loading in a new section from disk to fit in the smaller memory space on the original Xbox. In the homebrew scene, it meant an easier porting process of games and emulators. And x86 being shared across the original Xbox and PC was the main reason why the scene was thriving. At the time, emulation was almost exclusively x86 based. Yes, there were other emulators that ran on PowerPC based Macs and such, but the top tier stuff was all x86 exclusive. Things like dynamic recompilers were rare on anything other than x86 too. So it provided an avenue for the original Xbox to become the ultimate homebrew machine, which it was for years to come, and still makes a very exceptional system even to this day. When Microsoft began discussing the next Xbox and dropping hints to the public, speculation on the hardware was discussed. What would it end up being? What processor would end up being used? And what architecture would it run? The rumors had either Intel or ARM as the front runners. But if it was the Intel chip, what would it be based on? In 2003, Intel launched the Pentium 4 HT processor. HT stood for hyper-threading. The chip was clocked at 3 GHz and had a 200 MHz physical clock. On paper, this sounds like a massive increase over the original Xbox single-core 733 MHz Celeron processor, but the Pentium 4 was a disaster for Intel. Not only did they run extremely hot, they utilized RDRAM instead of traditional DRAM, but perhaps the biggest problem of all was NetBurst. Pentium 4 chips came with a 20-stage pipeline which allowed for incredible clock speeds, but the problem was the pipeline would frequently stall due to cache misses or branch prediction issues. 
And because it was a 20 stage pipeline, it would take significantly longer than normal for it to refill. In comparison, AMD's Athlon XP was much cheaper than the Pentium 4 and came with a 9 stage pipeline, which could run faster and more optimized than the Pentium 4, even with a slower clock. But in reality, both the Pentium 4 and the Athlon XP would not be suitable for games. Microsoft would realize that they needed to design their own chip. They would take heavy losses on the original Xbox, and while it put their name on the map as a real player in video games, they needed to control the design and cost much better this time round. Using off-the-shelf PC parts would not fly. They needed to be able to control the price and allow a path for price reductions over time. Initially, Microsoft turned to use Intel to build a custom processor for the next Xbox. But it's rumored that these negotiations weren't going very well. Sony had its own chip factories and controlled the process, but Microsoft would have zero leverage. On the graphics side, Microsoft and Nvidia would frequently disagree on pricing issues and in 2002 brought in arbitration to hear a dispute over price. You see, Microsoft would pay Nvidia for each chip sold, but when the updated MCPX chip, the 1.1 revision was designed that fixed a security issue, it meant a hardware change and all existing stock would be unusable. Microsoft left Nvidia to absorb the costs. By 2003, both Microsoft and Nvidia had agreed to part ways with Microsoft securing a future technology agreement with ATI, which would license graphic technology for the Xbox 360 and beyond. But to control the hardware, they needed to design it themselves, and that began with the processor. After negotiations broke down with Intel who were unwilling to customize, Microsoft would task engineers from the old Web TV team for the job of the next generation processor that would power the Xbox 360. Web TV was set-top box technology that allowed any television access to the internet with web browsing and email at a low cost for consumers. These engineers were already well versed in the risk or reduced instruction set architecture with Web TV, and the design would continue this path. Risk in a video game console made sense, and with the design approved, Microsoft in 2003 approached IBM and partnered with them on the processor. This would utilize a PowerPC architecture based on PowerPC 970, but with heavy customizations. It would contain three cores and six hardware threads, utilize eFuse technology, the first of any console, and encryption was built into the microprocessor itself, making it much more difficult to reverse engineer. But how would IBM work with both Microsoft and Sony? When Sony approached IBM to help build the cell processor two years earlier, Unfortunately for them, its contract did not foreclose IBM working with any other partner. The PowerPC core was free to be used, and in turn, they supplied its core to Microsoft. In fact, IBM became an exclusive provider of processor technology in video games powering Nintendo, Sony, and Microsoft hardware by the mid-2000s. But perhaps the biggest surprise of all is the shift from Intel to PowerPC and that is the PowerPC 970 core that forms the basis of the Microsoft Xenon and the PlayStation cell processors ran so hot that there were engineering concerns about this processor being wedged into tight quarters with questionable airflow. Yet both Sony and Microsoft decided on these cores. And as we know, many thermal issues quickly began appearing with the red ring of death issues crippling the bottom line in terms of profit. It's also interesting to mention that while IBM had supplied PowerPC for the Xbox 360, the GameCube, the Nintendo Wii, the PlayStation 3, and the Nintendo Wii U, at the same time in the mid-2000s, they had lost their contract with Apple in favor of Intel supplying x86 chips for the Apple Macintosh. For developers, the shift from Intel to PowerPC was an interesting one. Microsoft would do an excellent job of providing SDKs that would offer up APIs that were for all intents and purposes equivalent to standard Windows 32 calls. It meant that an x86 Windows or original Xbox developer would be very comfortable developing code for the Xbox 360. However, generally speaking, this code would not run anywhere near at the level of performance that would be considered acceptable and would require an underlying understanding of risk, 
threading, cache assembly language, VMX instructions, loading and storing of data to and from memory, and registers to really take advantage of this next generation chip. Microsoft, Sony, and Nintendo would all use PowerPC-based hardware, but ultimately, all of them would move away again. In 2013, Microsoft went back to x86, or should I say x64, but this time not with Intel, rather ATI, powering the Xbox One line of hardware, and Sony followed suit for the first time in their history. Looking back, the decision to switch to PowerPC seemed like a bit of a strange one, especially considering the issues with heat and thermals, but ultimately Intel wasn't willing to provide Microsoft with what they needed for the price they wanted. IBM offered an unmatched price performance ratio that was compelling, and although the Xenon chip certainly had its quirks and perhaps didn't perform at the theoretical level of specification, its PowerPC core powered a console that for the first time would overtake Sony in sales, at least for the majority of the generation. So what do you think about this move to PowerPC that occurred in the mid-2000s? Going back and thinking about it, it seems a little strange that we had PowerPC that ever powered any of these consoles from Nintendo, Sony, and Microsoft. But, you know, you really have to just think about the bottom line. And ultimately, all three systems, the Wii, the Xbox 360, and the PlayStation 3 were very successful systems. And I think the biggest issue has to be the, the thermal issues that we saw from the Xbox Xbox 360 and the PlayStation 3. Now these issues were over time ultimately resolved, but it was something that wasn't really part of the initial kind of planning phase that you didn't really get the sense that Microsoft put too much emphasis on the fact that these chips ran extremely hot. And it wasn't really until they found out the hard way that it was apparent that there was an issue here with the red ring of death issues but ultimately power pc was a very important part of video games and it was one that really brought things forward to the current generation of where we are today but guys i'm going to leave it here for this video let me know what you think about it in the comments below and if you like this video you know what to do leave me a thumbs up and as always don't forget to like and subscribe and i'll catch you guys in the next video bye for now